I would like to thank you all for coming to our Hijinks with the Sphinx event today here at the museum. My name is Jennifer Wagner and I'm an associate curator in the Egyptian section. Uh, my own area of interest and expertise is ancient Egyptian language, specifically a phase of the language called Demotic, which is used at the sort of tail end of Egyptian history. Um, but for the past couple of years, my husband, Joe Wagner, who's also an Egyptologist here, and I have been working on a book about the history of the Penn Museum Sphinx. Um, some of you may have heard Joe's lecture earlier today. Or anybody? A couple people? Okay. So we, we tried very hard not to overlap too much on, on our information. So what I would like to do with you this afternoon is to sort of run you through um, the world of the ancient Egyptian Sphinx, what the Sphinx meant to the ancient Egyptians, the different types of Sphinxes we have, and places where we find Sphinxes both ancient and modern. So here we are at our, our celebration, um, and here is the, uh, the man or the half man, quarter man of <laughs> the hour, um, our Sphinx um, in the lower Egyptian gallery. Um, and as many of you know, or now know by the end of today, this Sphinx was discovered um, in 1912 by Flinders Petrie at the site of Memphis um, in this area up here um, near the Ta Temple. Um, and the following year, uh, it came to Philadelphia. Here's a letter um, from Petrie offering the director of our museum at the time um, the Sphinx, saying, we found this giant Sphinx. Is the Penn Museum interested in it? To which our director replied, yes, please. Um, and so it came to Philadelphia a um, hundred years ago this weekend. And here's a, a nice view of it from an old newspaper um, on a horse-drawn cart um, in front of the museum. Um, just wrapped in burlap and things like that. It was hoisted over the wall and it stayed in the garden out front of the museum where the fish pond is um, for several years, including in a snowstorm, um, until it was brought inside the museum. Uh, one of the important things about our Sphinx is that it is the largest ancient Egyptian Sphinx in the Western Hemisphere. Um, here you can see a chart of some of the other very large Sphinxes um, in the world. Of course, the Great Sphinx at Giza is the, the biggest ancient Sphinx of them all. Um, and our Sphinx falls in at uh, probably around number six, depending on how you count some of these pairs of Sphinxes. Um, so whether you count a pair as one or two. Um, but we're, we're pretty much uh, up there as far as largest sphinxes um, in the world. Um, here is a view of the sphinx in the garden um, where it was from 1913. 1913 until um, 1916 when it was moved inside the museum. Now even though, as you probably have noticed, our Sphinx does not have a face, we know whose Sphinx this was um, because of the hieroglyphs that are inscribed around the base of the Sphinx, um, which you can see in this um, shot here. You have an inscription that runs all the way around the Sphinx. Um, it's inscribed on the front here, as well as um, other cartouches of a different king on its shoulder. So the Sphinx belongs to Ramses II, or at least he claimed it um, as his Sphinx. And the text on the side of the Sphinx tells us basically the, the name, the, the five different names of Ramses II. Ancient Egyptian kings had five names. The last two of those names appeared in cartouches. Um, and so Ramsey's name um, appears here and here. Um, so this is really the, what the text on, on the Sphinx says. So that's how we're, we're, very, we're able to identify it even with lacking its um, facial features. Well, when we think of Sphinxes um, from Egypt, this, the Sphinx, like our Sphinx in the gallery, this recumbent Sphinx, this lying down Sphinx with the body of a lion and the head of a man, usually the king, um, is sort of the quintessential Egyptian Sphinx. And we find Sphinxes in ancient Egypt from as early as the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom um, with the great Sphinx at Giza is probably our 
our earliest um, example of a sphinx um, in Egypt, and that sphinx bears the, the likeness, bears the face of King Khafre, who is the builder of the second largest pyramid at Giza, um, and was probably meant to represent um, this king. And so the sphinx combines the head of a human being, so it has the intelligence of a man, but the power and you know, physical prowess of a lion. Um, and we find sphinxes in Egyptian art all the way through into the Roman period. So the sphinx, the iconography of the sphinx, the idea of the sphinx is something that is very long lived in Egyptian, ancient Egyptian culture. Sphinxes can be both male and female. Another very early sphinx, and may actually be slightly earlier than the one at um, the Great Sphinx at Giza, is this sphinx, which belonged to Queen Hetepares, who also lived during the Fourth Dynasty. Um, this is a much smaller sphinx, but it is an example of a female sphinx. So we can have male sphinxes in Egypt and female sphinxes in Egypt. Now, e Egypt, of course, isn't the only part of the world where you have these, this hybrid-type creature that combines the the part of a man and a, and a part of, of a lion. Um, you have examples of an Achaemenid sphinx here. Um, here is a, a creature called a manticore, which has the head of a man and the body of a lion. And here um, we have an Indian uh, deity, which in a slight reversal has the head of a lion and the body of, of a human. So there are, this idea of human-lion hybrids do appear in other cultures. Now, one thing that is super important to keep in mind when thinking about sphinxes is that the Egyptian sphinx is very different from the sphinx in Greek mythology, um, best known to us from the story of Oedipus and the sphinx, where the sphinx was this sort of demonic creature who um, had this riddle, had this question that would, it would ask anyone trying to enter the city and you know, people couldn't answer the riddle and then the sphinx would you know, attack them and eat them and, and kill them. So this, in Greek mythology, the sphinx was a malevolent creature. Whereas in Egyptian um, theology, thinking, uh, the sphinx is a, is a positive um, entity. So they're, they're very different, even though the name uh, that we have for them both is shared in you know, English usage today. In ancient Egyptian, the word for sphinx you see up here um, in hieroglyphs, which is shesep. Um, and sometimes you see it written shesep ankh. The word shesep really just means image. Um, or statue, and then the Egyptians can give this word, shesep, a determinative, a word that, a sign that comes at the end of a word to kind of tell you a little bit more about the word. And in this case, the image is an image of the sphinx. And here you have the Greek word sphinx. Um, and the Greek word sphinx actually comes from the Greek verb, which means to, to strangle or to twist. So even the word, the Greek word sphinx, has sort of a bad connotation, whereas the Egyptian word is you know, more, more positive. Um, when the Egyptians um, were faced with the great Sphinx at Giza, you know, built during the, the Fourth Dynasty, when kings of later periods and the Egyptians of later periods looked at this giant um, human-headed lion on the, the Giza Plateau there, they actually deified the statue um, of the Sphinx at Giza, and they gave it a new, a new name, a new identity. And in the New Kingdom, it became known as hor em the, the god hor em or sometimes you'll see his name in Greek written as Harmachus. And that name means Horus in the horizon. And with this idea, the Sphinx at Giza was thought of as a version of the sun god and was worshipped on its own as, as, a, as a deity in its own right. And here you see um, a private stela from the New Kingdom showing two individuals worshipping the Sphinx, and here you have sort of the stylized pyramids of Giza in the background. And this larger image here is from the Sphinx stela of Tutmosis IV, which is um, at, located at Giza, right between the paws of the Sphinx, and you see the king making offerings to the god Horamakhet, whose name is written right here in hieroglyphs, and you can see it written up there as well. And how they came to visualize um, the Sphinx as a sun god really has to do with 
the way that ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs worked and how the Egyptians sometimes thought of the landscape around them as a three-dimensional hieroglyph. So here you have the hieroglyph for the word achet, or horizon. And what this hieroglyph shows is a, um, a mountain or two hills with the sun appearing um, in the center of it. And if you look at Giza, like in this old photograph, where you have two, the two pyramids in the background, the sphinx then in the center takes the place of, of the sun disk in this hieroglyph. And lo and behold, the sphinx at Giza becomes a giant three-dimensional hieroglyph for the sun god in the horizon. Um, here is a, another close-up of the um, Sphinx stela, uh, the dream stela at, um, at Giza. And this is a really interesting text that we find on this, um, on this stela, on this monument. And it's located right here, right between the paws of the Sphinx. And what this text describes is an ancient Egyptian prince's encounter with the Sphinx at Giza, with this god, Horamachet or Harmachus. Um, and it describes how when Tutmosis IV was a prince, when he was a young man, he liked to ride his horses around the Giza Plateau. Um, this was a, you know, sort of a princely uh, way to relax. And we know even today, if you, you know, go to, to Egypt, go to Giza, you can um, ride horses and, and basically do the same thing that the ancient Egyptian um, royalty did and enjoy the, the landscape there. But so what happens is one day, he, the prince is out riding around on the Giza Plateau, and he stops to take a rest, and he falls asleep in the shadow of the Sphinx. And in, he has a dream, and in the dream, the Sphinx, or Horamachet, speaks to him and says, you know, I'm being smothered by the sand that's around me. And so we know at certain points in history, um, even up until relatively recently, the Sphinx could become completely covered um, in, it, in sand, almost up to, you know, covering its head. And the Sphinx in the dream asks the prince to, you know, remove the sand away from him and that if he does this for him, he will make sure that the prince then becomes king. And so we know that this, you know, this happens because lo and behold, you know, we, we know that this uh, young prince becomes Moses IV. So even in the ancient Egyptian texts, we see encounters that the Egyptians had with, with sphinxes. Here is a, a relic, a, a, an image from the late 1800s showing the Sphinx at Giza um, totally, almost totally encumbered by sand around it. So it may, it may have been the way it was when Tutmosis IV encountered it on his horse ride. Um, and this idea of resting by the Sphinx is something that um, has inspired modern artists. Um, this wonderful painting, which is in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, um, shows um, Mary and the baby Jesus and Joseph on the, the flight um, into Egypt taking a rest by a, a Sphinx. Now, since sphinxes are part lion, um, it's sort of interesting to look at lion imagery in Egyptian art and to see the, the important role that the lion played. Um, Egyptian kings are often shown accompanied by lions um, in battle. Sometimes Egyptian kings had lions as pets. So we have this statue, which is up in our upper Egyptian gallery, showing a, a somewhat silly looking lion um, who has on his chest a cartouche naming a king. And it's possible that this um, image of this sort of benevolent looking lion was supposed to represent um, a, royal, a royal pet. Um, we have other lion amulets, um, and this element is probably a piece of furniture from a, some sort of furniture element. And we have small gaming pieces made of ivory from very early in Egyptian history taking the shape of a lion. So, like many other cultures, the Egyptians were impressed by lions, and the Egyptian king sort of took the lion over as one of the, the royal, royal symbols of, of power. Um, our big sphinx in the lower Egyptian gallery is not our only sphinx here in the collection. Um, we do have several much smaller sphinxes, um, including a number of small statuettes and fragments of statuettes that clearly were not carved by master carvers. Um, so we have this poor creature here, and you can see two different 
views of him. So this is um, something that perhaps not the most talented sculptor in the world created, but it is certainly an image of a sphinx. One of our tiniest sphinxes, um, although she looks, he looks very large in the slide, is this gold or electrum element from a set of jewelry, probably from a bracelet very much like this one um, that's now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, so this is one of our, our tiniest and lightest sphinxes. Um, Egyptian scarabs are a very common and very popular artifact type. Um, we have several thousand examples of scarabs in our collection, and quite a number of them on the bottom of the scarab, where the decoration usually is, bear sphinx imagery, a different types of sphinxes in, in different poses. So the sphinx, again, a very popular um, iconographic motif for the ancient Egyptians. We also have terracotta figurines of sphinxes that were made in molds, so they were mass produced so that pilgrims who were coming to a temple could purchase one of these probably relatively inexpensive objects and then dedicate the, these things at the temple. Almost like a you know, modern day souvenir in a way. Um, as I said, the, the use of Egyptian Sphinx iconography goes all the way through the Pharaonic period and even later. Um, this box is from the Meroitic period um, in Nubia, so that's Egypt's neighbor to the south. And the Meroitic period in Nubia is basically contemporary with the, the Greco-Roman period in Egypt, or the Roman period. And so on this ebony box, you have ivory inlays, um, including two Sphinx images here as well as a frontal lion um, here and perhaps at the top as well and here's just a close-up of what that sphinx um, looks like. From the palace of Merneptah, with mu much of which is on display in our lower Egyptian gallery, we have windows um, from the palace itself. Uh, these are windows made of stone but that imitate what the uh, real windows, window blinds would have been made out of. So you have these rolled up reeds here, carved in stone, so they're, they're permanent, they're gonna last forever. And this entire window is sort of laden with religious symbolism and iconography. Uh, and notice at the top here, you have two seated sphinxes. You have a row of falcon heads um, representing Horus or a version of the sun god, you have these elements here, these are jed pillars. The jed pillar was a symbol of stability. Um, it was also thought of as the backbone of the god Osiris. So this entire window is just chock full of um, sort of religious iconography, including the two sphinxes at the top. All protective imagery, all um, doing things to protect the king and the, the space of the, the palace in which the king was um, you know, moving through. Now we do have um, in the, the museum, not in the Egyptian collection, other examples of sphinxes, some of which are Greek sphinxes. So in our Mediterranean collection, we have um, this vessel decorated with these winged sphinxes. And in our Near East section, we have these ivory uh, plaques, which probably decorated elements of furniture or perhaps boxes, um, showing two different types of sphinxes here. So sphinxes aren't only found in the Egyptian section here, you can wander through other parts of the museum and encounter um, sphinx imagery. Now for the ancient Egyptians, sphinxes could come in a variety of different flavors, if you will. So our recumbent um, lion with a human head, that's the most common and most popular form, and those we call androsphinxes or, or human-headed sphinxes. But we also find um, falcon-headed sphinxes, which we call Heracco sphinxes, as well as um, ram-headed sphinxes, which we refer to as cryosphinxes. And if the Andro Sphinx really represents sort of the king in this powerful, you know, sort of divine form. These other sphinxes were probably sacred to various gods who could take the form of these animals. So the god Amun, for example, often appeared in the form of a ram. Um, so sphinxes like this may have been set up in front of temples dedicated to the god Amun. Here are just two examples of Haraco sphinxes, or the falcon-headed sphinxes. Um, a recumbent lying down example, as well as a seated example here. 
um, two examples of the ram-headed sphinxes, both a, um, a statue and then a stela, showing this ram here being worshipped by someone over here. And then the sphinx in this case is identified as Amun-Re, um, the lord of the thrones of the two lands of Egypt. So we know who this sphinx is supposed to represent. And here, um, in front of the temple, we would often find uh, avenues of sphinxes, much smaller than the one we have in the Lower Egyptian Gallery, set up, sort of protecting the pathways leading up to the temple. We can also find um, combinations that aren't human or ram or um, falcon. We have this somewhat damaged example of a crocodile sphinx, um, somewhat rare, but you see it has a crocodile tail and its head is now gone. It probably represented the god Sobek, who appeared in crocodile form. Here is an example of a seated snake sphinx, which is not easy to say. Um, and so, the, as I said before, sphinxes can come in male and female forms. So here are two examples of female sphinxes. On one hand, the one of Hetaperas that I showed you at the beginning. And on the other, here, a sphinx of Queen Hatshepsut, who is sort of an interesting character in and of herself because she was a female who ruled as a male king. So while this sphinx does depict a female ruler, um, in actual fact, she is shown as if she is a male king. Sphinxes can sit like cats. So a lion is really just a big cat. So sometimes we do see sphinxes seated in a more cat-like pose, um, here with a human head with this very curious hairstyle. Um, sphinxes can also stand, sort of at attention, be very alert in the way that they look. Um, they can also stand and trample enemies. So here on the seat of a, um, a royal chair, you have a, a striding sphinx who is trampling the enemies of Egypt. So it is the king, in the form of a sphinx, actually taking out enemies um, under, his, under his paws. Um, here are striding sphinxes in um, falcon form. So you have a falcon, the falcon has wings, and the body of a lion. And again, you've got the enemies of Egypt being crushed underfoot. And just to make it clear that this is, a roi that this is you know, under the guise of the king doing this, you have the cartouche here bearing the pharaoh's name. Sphinxes can also, instead of having lion paws, can have human hands. Um, and, and in these cases, they often hold offerings. So here, different, a vessel um, with a ram head at the top. Here, two offering jars. And in this case down here, you have a, a recumbent sphinx with human arms and wings. And in this case, a female head. So sphinxes, again, they can take all different types of, of forms. Uh, we do have one ancient Egyptian god, separate from Harmachus, who can take the form of a sphinx, and that is the god Tutu. Um, he appears quite late in Egyptian religion, um, but he does have the body of the lion, the head of a human, and he has some additional features that regular sphinxes don't have. Like You may be able to notice that his tail is actually a serpent, and he has another head of a lion popping out of his back, and he also has, coming out of his paws, daggers or knives and scorpions. So he was a protective deity, but he combined all of these sort of fearsome elements within him. Now, there are many places that if you encounter a sphinx, it wouldn't surprise you to find a sphinx there. So in front of temples in Egypt, in front of the pyramids, certainly walking through museum galleries, if you encountered a sphinx, it wouldn't surprise you to find a sphinx there. Um, even some sphinxes, like our sphinx, that have traveled outside of Egypt, but rather than be inside a museum or outside, like this one of a pair of sphinxes that's in St. Petersburg in Russia, um, that, so these are all places you might not be surprised to find sphinx, sphinxes, but there are other places where sphinxes or sphinx imagery turns up that is a little unusual and perhaps not exactly what the ancient Egyptians had in mind um, low those many thousands of years ago. 
Um, here is a Sphinx monument um, in a cemetery. So this is a modern example of a Sphinx. Again, not too strange to find a Sphinx in a cemetery. That wouldn't be too far off from you know, the, what the ancient Egyptians would have thought. Um, if any of you have had a chance to visit the Masonic Temple downtown on, on Broad Street, it's a fantastic place. They do tours of the various rooms there, and each of the rooms are themed. But when you walk through the front door, uh, you are greeted with a pair of sphinxes that are sort of semi-Egyptian style, um, but so they, they greet you as you walk in. So again, not uncommon to find sphinxes sort of protecting an entryway. Uh, here is just a view of what the Egyptian hall in the Masonic Temple uh, downtown looks like. It is absolutely stunning. Um, I highly recommend taking a visit there if you haven't had a chance to, um, to see it. Um, and that is just one place in Philadelphia where you can, you, you can encounter Egyptianizing architecture. So um, people have long been interested in Egyptian iconography um, and oftentimes modern or relatively modern buildings around us uh, use Egyptian iconography, including sphinxes. So there's this fire insurance company building downtown at Fifth and Chestnut that has an Egyptian style facade. I just learned about this one last night. This was a prison, Moyamen Singh Prison, um, which was knocked down in 1968 um, in Philadelphia and had a, uh, one of the buildings there, it was a debtor's prison, had an Egyptian um, facade. The Wanamaker's department store, um, you can walk through there and see Egyptianizing elements. Many of you are familiar with the Bala Theater, also Egyptianizing elements. So lots of places that sphinxes and um, Egyptian things turn up. And now we're going to turn to places where the Egyptians might have been quite surprised to see sphinxes. So I told you that the Great Sphinx at Giza is the largest um, Egyptian sphinx in the world. That's not entirely true. Well, it's the largest ancient Egyptian sphinx in the world. The largest sphinx in the world actually resides in Las Vegas in front of the Luxor um, Casino. Um, and this sphinx um, is quite a bit taller than the sphinx at Giza. So this one actually gets the prize as the biggest sphinx in the world. Um, Egyptian sphinxes can appear on modern jewelry elements, um, so bracelets, pins, necklaces, earrings. Um, Egyptian motifs in fashion and in jewelry and in home furnishings um, kind of goes through periods of popularity around about the time of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Uh, people are very crazy about using Egyptian elements in, in fashion and in their homes. Um, it has another surge when we see the, the, good ho the Hollywood films like Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra. Again, there's an interest in incorporating Egyptian um, elements. And movies like the, the Mummy series and The Scorpion King, again, brings ancient Egypt to the, the, popular, um, the popular mind. Other places where the Egyptians might have been quite surprised to find sphinxes are on things like this mug where you have an image of Sandy Claws, um, so a sphinx wearing a Santa hat and beard, a sphinx salt and pepper shaker. Um, the heavy metal band Iron Maiden incorporates Egyptian sphinx iconography on their album cover here. Um, other types of music, um, perhaps a little very different from Iron Maiden are these examples of sheet musics from the early part of um, last century. So around the 1920s, 1930s, um, we find a lot of Egyptian iconography on the covers of these sheet musics. Um, and here's a series that have a bunch of sphinxes as part of their decoration. Sphinxes um, and sphinx imagery also used by novelists, so romance novels, children's books, um, the, the famous novel The Sphinx by Robin Cook all incorporate this idea of, sort of the mystery of the, of the sphinx. Uh, here's another uh, romance novel. I have not read this one, but reading the um, blurb, the description of it on Amazon, uh, it actually has nothing at all to do with ancient Egypt or the ancient Egyptian sphinx, uh, but for some reason having a, a pyramid and a sphinx on the cover would be a, a good way to sell a book, I guess. We find sphinxes, or the name sphinxes, on children's toys. 
Um, and the Sphinx often appears in advertising. So the Sphinx um, is something that can be seen as sort of exotic. Egypt is a very exotic place. There's an, it's an, an antiquity. Um, the Sphinx is seen as something that is quite enduring. It's long-lasting. And so ad people who are trying to sell their products would like to tie some of these ideas to their product. Their product is exotic, their product will last a long time. So here we see sphinxes on um, citrus fruit labels. Um, we have sphinxes being used to sell uh, different kinds of liquor. So in order to get a sphinx to talk, you can serve them some four roses and that will get them talking right away. Um, you can make a sphinx smile by giving him some of this candy. Um, the Sphinx also used to sell various kinds of soft drinks. So Pepsi Cola um, from I think like the 1950s has this ad here. And then the Sphinx had apparently its own brand of, of sodas or soft drinks, Sphinx drinks, um, with some delightful sounding uh, flavors there. The durability factor of the Sphinx is used to sell shoes, um, and rather than a, a human head, you have a, a dog head here because it's hush puppy shoes, so we've replaced the face of the Sphinx with the head of a dog. And beloved Snoopy, of course, is selling um, life insurance, and just like the ancient Sphinx is very stable, um, so is MetLife Insurance Company. Um, Sphinxes have also been used to sell acne medication. You don't want your skin to be as dried out as the Sphinx, so if you use this particular type of product, it will work, you know, not, it won't cause that problem. The Sphinx is also used to sell things as random as typewriter paper and toilets. <laughs> the Sphinx is very silent, and so is this brand of toilet. So Sphinxes turn up in very, very strange places. Um, who knew that sphinxes had such a connection to teeth? As far as I know, there is no ancient Egyptian depiction of a sphinx smiling or with teeth showing, but here you have two different um, toothpaste-like products um, connecting the secret of the sphinx to a bright, shiny smile. Um, and of course, our, our celebration here today kind of brings the Sphinx in, in popular culture, um, kind of ties together the, the ancient, um, our, our wonderful 15-ton red granite Sphinx, and sort of celebrates how the Sphinx appears in, in pop culture. Um, and I'm sure all of you have had a chance to have your picture taken in, in, with your head um, so you too can become a Sphinx. Um, and I've gotten a chance to take home one of our portable sphinxes, which you can turn into a hat if you are so inclined. Um, you can even really make it quite special and electrify the hat and have it like this. So I, I encourage you when you go home to maybe incorporate your, your sphinx into a, a hat like this. Um, I have to say that I, I seem to have a, a bit of a hat problem. I don't know if any of you have noticed the very large hat that the Sphinx is wearing there. Um, in addition to making this lovely headgear, I also made the giant Sphinx party hat. So in my spare time when I'm not doing Egyptology, I'm crafting very strange hats. So that is the end of my presentation on the wonderful world of sphinxes, and I'm sure I have time for questions. If any of you have any questions about Egypt or sphinxes or anything, I'm happy to give it a shot and answer some of them. Thank you very much.